Hi, uh, I'm Jim Carrier. I'm a reporter uh, living here in Burlington. And uh, I want to show you a little story, some of the history about this uh, nuclear buildup, the history of it, and we'll get into a discussion. Hopefully it'll spark a discussion of uh, what we should do about it. Um, we just watched the movie, the documentary, I should say, called um, the, the, A Television Event, which was a documentary about the ABC movie in 1983 uh, called The Day After. And uh, both of them were powerful films. And um, we are now having a discussion later about, or now, about what our current situation is all these many years later. Some of this is history that you may already know and some that you may not. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of um, information uh, that uh, I'll, I'll give you. I'll try to slow down a little bit, but there's a lot that's been happening in the last few years that most people do not know about. This is a picture of the Trinity bomb. As you can see at the bottom, it says uh, it was 1 40th second. This was the first atomic bomb in 1945, shot off in, a, in New Mexico. I was one year old when this bomb went off. I grew up on, under the atomic cloud. Even on a farm in the Finger Lakes of upstate New York, the menace of nuclear war, what I see emerging from this blast, um, hung over us. At school, we practiced duck and cover. Outside the barn, I built a straw bale lookout with manuals of enemy planes. At our supper table, our family agreed to take in refugees from New York City should the Russians drop their atomic bombs there. A bomb that was a replica of Trinity, stolen by Klaus Fuchs, a Los Alamos scientist who helped create the bomb, a man whose father became a Quaker minister, a man who joined the Communist Party after his family was persecuted by the Nazis. And when the Russians exploded Joe one, four years after Trinity, the nuclear arms race began. It never ended really, and we are now engaged in a new race that is deadlier and more frightening than at any time in our history. This is the Trinity bomb. In simple terms, it, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to change the slide here. I thought it would click somehow. I'm going to do the here, let's see, I'm going to do this. There. This is the Trinity bomb in simple terms. It is a little sphere of plutonium about the size of a softball, pewter in color, warm to the touch, weighing about 13 pounds. When it exploded in 1945, its yield was 18.6 kilotons, 18,000 tons of TNT. This is Fat Man, a replica of Fat Man, the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. It's a plutonium, same design as Trinity. Its yield was 20 kilotons. Remember that number, 20 kilotons. What began as the race is depicted in this graphic here about the number of warheads from 1945 to 2023. I'm going to walk over a minute and show you the peak. You can see the peak. Right here. 1983, four. When we had 70,000... When we had 70,000 nuclear weapons around the world. This was between two countries at the time. And then you can see on the graphic a number of the treaties that began to reduce the number, including the last one, April, called New Start in April of 2010. This is from the Federation of American Scientists. And um, so that's it. Some of you may remember 
the Cold War, the most bizarre, insane standoff. We developed during that time new bombs and exploded them in the Nevada test site outside of Las Vegas and in Bikini in the Pacific. We exploded a more than a thousand bombs between 1945 and 1992. 216 of them were atmospheric. And the fallout reached around the globe, including upstate New York, where I had lived. In Vegas, they were a major tourist attraction. You can see one on the left behind the ballerina. For several years, a contest was held in Las Vegas for Miss Atomic Bomb. On the right is Lee Merlin, a Copa showgirl at the Sands Hotel. That photo with her mushroom cloud outfit was released in May of 1957. At, a, at the height of the standoff, what was called mutually assured destruction, or MAD, we had developed a missile that could carry 10 to 12 warheads, each aimed at a different target. Ronald Reagan, the president who loved Westerns, called it the peacekeeper after the Colt Army pistol. Each of these warheads is six feet long or high, weighs 800 pounds, and has a yield of 300 kilotons. Nagasaki was 20. In 2010, President Obama and Russian President Dmitry Medvedev signed a strategic arms reduction treaty known as New START, which reduced the number of warheads to 1,550 for each con uh, nation uh, that has deployed warheads in missiles, planes, and submarines, what we call the triad of defense. And despite Putin's recent rhetoric, both countries are still abiding by that treaty. But to get to the U.S. Senate to ratify that treaty, Obama and Vice President Biden cut a deal with a handful of Republican senators led by John Kyle of Arizona to modernize our nuclear system. It's called modernization, but it really is a whole new nuclear war machine. It includes eight projects, new ICBMs, cruise missiles, updates to submarine launched missiles, a new stealth bomber, a new strategic submarines, updates to existing gravity bombs, modifications to the F-35 fighter jet that allow it to drop nuclear weapons, and updates to the existing Cold War nuclear con command and control network. So far, Congress has spent about $100 billion. But the projections are that over 30 years, it will cost $1.7 trillion. There is still debate about some of these projects, but the military-industrial complex is forging ahead with 400 new ICBMs, a dozen new submarines that are going to be built in Connecticut, 100 new bombers, new warheads, and significantly, 80 new plutonium pits. We haven't made a plutonium pit in this country since 1989, when the infamous Rocky Flats factory was shut down by the FBI. This is an old picture from Los Alamos of a plutonium pit. The pit, the word means, uh, just like it sounds, it's like a peach pit. It's the heart of a nuclear bomb. The poop, the, in, in modern warheads, the plutonium pit is called the primary. You can see it at the top of the illustration there. It's ex it explodes much like the Trinity w was, which surrounding explosives squeeze the sphere, which is about the size of a grapefruit, into a critical mass which fissions like the original atomic bomb, and whose x-rays cause a secondary stage, essentially tritium, which is a cousin of hydrogen, or H3, and that fusion reaction, like the sun, is the power behind modern weapons. This is a busy graphic showing how Los Alamos plans to recycle old plutonium pits 
We have more than 20,000 sitting in bunkers in Pantex, Texas. And if you follow the circle from the top clockwise, they will be melted, cast into new half spheres, machined and welded into new pits. And they will be purer because deteri plutonium deteriorates over time. Well, once they pass inspection, essentially lost my place. Once they pass inspection, they will be stamped with a diamond-shaped mark and considered war ready. All of this dangerous work is done inside of glove boxes. You can see on the side there. Los Alamos says the first new one, war ready plutonium pit, will be produced by the end of the year, maybe by late summer. It will go into a new warhead, the W87-1. This is a model of it. It will be carried in a new missile, in a new submarine. So why are we doing this? Because the world has changed since the end of the Cold War. There are now nine nuclear weapons, uh, nine nuclear powers. China and North Korea are building new bombs and weapons. And just this week, as you probably read, the U.S. has revealed that the Russians are testing the idea of putting a nuclear weapon in space. If it were to explode, it would destroy a lot of satellites that we count on. These warheads are fueling U.S. modifications. Three are being built or modified, and the two on the right are still being designed. Here it is in numbers. This is our arsenal. We have 3750 warheads, meaning the plutonium pit inside a bomb. Our current arsenal also includes all those pits at Pentex. We have a W88 bomb that is, as you can see, 475 kilotons and will hold up to 12 in one missile. We have two that are variable. They call them dial a yield. You, they can actually change it from like the B61, dial a yield, they go from 0 0.3 to 340 kilotons, and the W80-4 can go from 0 0.2 to 150 kilotons. These are weapons that are already in our arsenal. Then what's planned is the W87-1, which will be 475 kilotons, and the W93, which is being designed for the new Columbia submarine. All of this work is being done at what is called the Enterprise, a complex of labs and factories run by the National Nuclear Security Administration. And all of these slides, you can see the logo down in the lower left there. That's the uh, division of the Energy Department, uh, a semi-autonomous division. And on top of that, the people in that department are actually federal employees. There are about 2,600 of them who contract with private companies who employ 65,000 workers. And I wrote a piece about all of this uh, for the Progressive Magazine last year. I won't go into all the details, but you can see on the left, going from left to right, Lawrence Livermore and Los Alamos in green are the two design, d bomb design companies, uh, factories or uh, laboratories. We have the national security site that is ready to test. Be Congress told it they need to be ready to test if a president decides we want to again. Sandia, Kansas City, Pentax, they're all parts of putting these things together, making parts for the bombs and then putting them together. Y-12 is the old like Oak Ridge where they made the original plutonium that went to Hanford to make, I mean, they made uh, enriched uh, uranium, which went to Hanford, now closed, uh, to be put in a reactor and create plutonium. And Savannah River in South Carolina which is 
going to be making treaty, or, uh, tritium as well, and they are also going to be making plutonium pits. Congress has ordered those two companies, those two labs, to make 80 a year uh, within, by 19, by 2030. I just finished a piece for the Progressive to be published next month about the great silence in this country about this nuclear, the new nuclear arms race. It tries to answer the question, where is the protest of the kind that Vermont led in 1982 when a million people converted, con converged on New York Central Park? There are many factors. We can talk about this. Lack of news coverage, the aging of the peace movement, competition from lots of other issues, abortion, immigration, racism. This particular piece that I'm writing, we're just finished, was really sparked by Robin Lloyd, who in March saw a piece in the New York Times about it and called a meeting of, the, I'll, I'll say, the peace movement elders uh, to rebuild the movement. And this gathering is a st another step. The movie Oppenheimer, which you may have seen, depressed me because I knew what was going on now. I think Oppenheimer and Trinity are sealed in a kind of nostalgic amber. We have forgotten what a nuclear war can do. So I thought I'd end this talk by showing what it did 79 years ago. And some of these pictures you may not have seen. This is a Japanese soldier who is suffering from purpura, it's called spots of death, after being exposed to fallout in Hiroshima, which was, by the way, not a plutonium bomb. This is the Hiroshima Dome. It's been now part, head of a, rebuilt and made uh, the center of the Hiroshima Peace Park. If you ever get a chance to go there, I urge you to do that. And then finally, I will show you four pictures from Nagasaki, which is a bomb that we don't think much about, but it was as destructive as Hiroshima. And with that, I thank you and I'm happy to ask any questions or help bring along a, f a discussion. We can pass this mic around if you have something you'd like to say. Would you uh, like to talk about what you're planning to do? Yeah, uh, hi there. My name is Charlotte Dennett, and um, I'm a Burlington resident. I'm the author. My latest book is called Follow the Pipelines, and it's about my investigation into the death of my father back in 1947 uh, after top secret visit to Saudi Arabia. He was America's top master spy. Now why am I talking today at this event? Because of Gaza. Because of Gaza. What a nightmare. And what makes the nightmare even worse is that there are actually members of Netanyahu's right-wing cabinet who are talking about the day after or how to finish it off, actually. Netanyahu wants to finish it off. He wants to finish slaughtering Palestinians. And there's one way you could do it really quickly, with a nuclear bomb. So I just wanted to show you a couple of clips. First of all, look who in our US Senate is even contemplating this. Why are they starving the Palestinians? Why are they killing the Palestinians? Why are they making Gaza unlivable? It's very simple, they want to drive them out. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Intercontinental. My name is Tom Switzer. 
I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Independent Studies. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know much about CIS, we're a public policy research <laughs> organisation. We're just based up Sorry. on Macquarie Street. And um, we are primarily... This is this is the one I want. I'm sorry. So it's not that one. That's the that's the forward button. All right. Is this the one? Which that's, one? Here. That's pause. Yeah. And then if you this one. Nope. Nope. Not. Just that leave one. it. Yeah, it's okay. I'm sorry. sorry. Cut. <laughs> Oh, it's YouTube. You can't do it. All right. Okay. I'll talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Would it be possible to put on the screen at that point the link? So people would have the option to go to YouTube? Yes, that would be helpful. And um, so somebody needs to talk to Megan O'Rourke about the CCP and about what may not happen here today. I'm just going to just tell her and then she can copy it. And then you can just hit the left one when you're yeah, You're welcome to send yeah. her a copy of this tape and the earlier movie and the link to everything that's here. And she'll talk to you about what she can do. Who, who will? Megan, Megan O'Rourke. All right, so if I press that, we're going. In any event, yeah, I mean, he, he is proposing that, and there was another person in uh, the cabinet. He's a minor position. He's the Minister of Culture, Amical Elahu, but he also advocated nuking the Gazans, and that would end it really quickly. And so what we see is we have a right-wing a uh, fascist regime in Israel, the most right-wing government that's ever existed in Israel, which has already uh, dropped um, at the very outset of the war the equivalent of 25,000 um, tons of explosives on the Gaza Strip since the beginning of the October 7th uh, event equivalent to two nuclear bombs. And I'm sure that uh, many of you have seen the incredible uh, signs of devastation of Gaza. And it's, um, it's just so phenomenally upsetting um, to many of us that our own government keeps trying to somehow walk back and sanitize the horror of Gaza. I mean, we even have uh, people denying that it's genocide, and I think probably everybody in the audience today have been watching genocide on television. How dare they say this isn't genocide when we see the massive uh, destruction of the buildings, the withholding of aid, the withholding of food, the starvation of the population. And now we hear that one way to end it is by nuking them. So uh, this is an existential issue. It, I mean, it, it's really serious for U.S. standing in the world, and I think the Biden administration has finally come to realize that. It's had a huge impact on Israel's standing in the world. It has greatly increased anti-Semitism in the world. 
And yet there are many politicians that just don't seem to want to grapple uh, with this fundamental issue. And um, one, one little point that I wanted to bring up after Jim was saying, like, why is this happening? Why the buildup of nuclear weapons now? And I would raise, and I have been raising, why the attack, this vicious attack on Gaza? Why? Why, are, why is it happening? And uh, <clears throat> what I put forward in my book is that Israel and Gaza and Lebanon and Syria all border the eastern Mediterranean. That's why I passed out those leaflets for you to look at the map. And what you will see is uh, in the map, it goes back to, to 1945, and you will see three pipelines that terminate uh, on those shores. One of them terminates in Haifa, Palestine, and it carried oil from Iraq. Um, and another projected pipeline was from Saudi Arabia that was supposed to terminate either in Haifa or Lebanon. And when I was researching um, the death of my father by a plane crash after his top secret mission as America's first master spy in the Middle East, I might add, why, um, <clears throat> what was going on at that time? I, I came across an article in the New York Times, and I'm sorry, I thought I could project it up here, but I can't. So I'm gonna have to read from it, and then I'll bring it back to the present about all the militarization that's going on. The title is, this is March 2, 1947, New York Times. Pipeline for U.S. adds to Middle East issues. And the subtitle is, Oil concessions raise questions involving the position of Russia. That's 1947. It's still going on. It's still going on. I call it, I call it the great game for oil. And I want to read just a section here. It says, uh, protection of that investment, this Trans-Arabian pipeline was huge American investment. Protection of that uh, investment and here and the military and economic uh, security that it represents inevitably will become one of the prime objectives of American foreign policy in this area which already has become a pivot of world politics and one of the main focal points of rivalry between East and West and of course East was then the Soviet Union so what, what I'm trying to say here <coughs> Is it still going on, and that the um, that whole area, the Eastern Mediterranean, has now got five hundred billion dollars worth of oil and natural gas right off their coast, and there's more that's been discovered in Gaza, and there's more oil and natural gas that's been discovered in the West Bank, and that in uh, the year two thousand. Um, I'm sorry, in the year 2009, Netanyahu launched one of his first major attacks on Gaza. And the whole aim, and I have the quote from uh, the then defense minister, was to prevent the proceeds of that oil and natural gas from getting into the hands of the Palestinians. That became the same motivation for the second assault on Gaza that happened in 2014. Same reason. Up till now, the Palestinians have not been able to uh, benefit from these massive uh, reserves of, of oil and natural gas because the Netanyahu regime has prevented it from happening. And I, I bring it up to the nuclear issue because, <clears throat> again, going back to the article in the New York Times, the military and economic support of the Trans-Arabian pipeline was all important. In fact, my father wrote in one of the declassified documents that I got in 1944, when he was sent over to Lebanon, he said, um, <clears throat> and this is a, a heavily redacted document, he said, uh, we must protect the oil at all costs. That was what he was supposed to do. 
do everything he could in the region to make sure that pipeline was safe. And then I found out the pipeline by one of his associates was considered an artery of empire. And so these memes have continued all the way up to the present. What we're seeing now are these uh, incredible, they're wars for oil, I'm sorry. They're, they are petro, petro uh, powers, primarily the US and uh, the Russians and other powers as well, vying against each other. And the reason that the uh, oil and uh, oil is not mentioned is because it's the fuel of the military. It's still primarily the fuel of the mil military. I would like to ask you, Jim, if these new submarines are going to be nuke-powered or oil-powered. And if they're going to be nuke-powered, where does that put us? That's kind of scary, isn't it? Uh, but at any rate, my thesis, which I can back up with documentation, is that this onslaught, this total destruction of Gaza, and it's not just Hamas, mind you, it's the destruction of Gaza. And then they have plans for afterwards. Uh, and the plan, one of the plans for Netanyahu, which he has held for many years, is to build a pipeline uh, energy corridor that extends up through Gaza, through Lebanon, through Syria, and, and to be able to feed these riches in oil and natural gas to Europe, which is now uh, very nervous because uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was sabotaged, so they're not getting the same amount of cheap energy as they were. This has forced Biden to go hand in hand to like Saudi Arabia seeking, um, seeking uh, his support, yes Robin, and it's the military protection of this oil that is all in for important and exists to this day. Okay, thank you. Did I go thank too you. long? No, no, fine, but I think uh, people might have questions, and I have one question, which is if um, all this oil is there that is so important, there is no way that Israel would nuke Gaza because they would destroy uh, the, the potential of developing the oil. Right. It, the, all that land would be uh, contaminated. And I'm just wondering, are there other questions out here? Or do you want to answer that one? I mean, I, I, that's a good point. That's a good point. I mean, first of all, you know, how rational are these people that are suggesting nuking Gaza? Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't even know if they've thought that through, Robin. It, 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 they must think it through. Well, if they thought it through, they wouldn't say it. Is my yeah. is my thinking? It could be a scare tactic, tactic, but. Um, Another thing is that you cannot, you cannot, um, if you want to run an infrastructure project, which in my opinion is going to be running energy corridors, and that means pipelines all along the eastern Mediterranean, you cannot do that unless you can assure international banks that are going to finance the projects that there is no unrest in the region. So that's the plan. My wipe out Hamas, re, Hamas uh, reproduce it with a, uh, a uh, demilitarized Palestinian state, and uh, do economic development, and that's going to solve all the problems, which it will not, I guarantee. So I'll pass this around so it gets on TV, whoever wants to use the mic and ask a question. But I just wanted to say the picture of Hiroshima, or Nagasaki was it? There was a couple pictures. Well, that looks like Gaza, and so Gaza has already been nuked. Okay, in in a sense, it's already been nuked. To me, the way we bring back the concern about nuclear weapons is to work in the movement, the Palestine Liberation Movement, because that's where not only young people are, but where the feelings of seeing this ultimate destruction are. They've been in it, they've been feeling it, they know it, they've been studying the weapons. So I think we're helping giving them more information about the ultimate weapons 
and and it's incredible these these little uh, softball shaped you know this technology is they see this technology these kids they're in it they you know to them it's and it's all these chips that are being made for these smart bombs so I just think that that's where we should go with this is to bring it you know uh, recognize that Gaza has is been nuked and that we're being taught that um, this can happen that it's okay that this destruction is okay but I don't think us as a bunch of older people who are so well versed in this are going to inspire those people I think we have to give them the information but I, d I, I mean I'm, I'm confused of where to go from here but I anyway on uh, if you signed our our, um, our thing there's a meeting on zoom in a month on the 19th and if you have your email on here we'll send you the link and you can come and we'll talk more because it's so complex isn't it the the extreme nature of these things so um, I'd like to pass the mic to anyone who wants to talk oh yeah, yeah. Um, my name is Judy Yarnell. I just wanted to add that the the line between conventional military weapons and nuclear weapons is now being blurred uh, with these B-61 bombs, tactical nuclear weapons, they're called, that can be used on the battlefield, and they can be dialed up or down. I think it's quite likely that these bombs will be used in, in Ukraine or Russia or Gaza. And guess what? The F-35s were built to carry these bombs. So that's dangerous for the anti-nuclear movement for people who are against nukes and want world peace. It's creeping in the weapons itself. Um, I wish that we could open up the conversation again the way it was open in 1982 and at the time uh, the day after was made. And anybody's suggestions on how to, how to do that would be very welcome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you want to respond? Sure. So, so we do have to we do have to be careful because Gaza hasn't been nuked by a nuclear bomb yet. Like but you no, you feel it. It's fine. But you got right. No, the rubble. I mean, it yeah. it is. I mean, people have made co comparison to the total massive de destruction, and it was the United States that that sold uh, the two thousand pound bombs. To Israel, and that's what's be, that's what has been dropped, and that was about to go, I believe, in the latest shipment. And then people had such an outcry that I believe that they have held up those offensive weapons. And this is be well, this has become a, uh, a a real problem for for President Biden, and uh, I I think he hopes that over time uh, they'll be able to moderate uh, Netanyahu's war enough so uh, people will believe that, um, you know, we're not going to have a real problem over there. But, yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Can I, can I Go ahead. Yeah. Let's get as many people to say something as they would like. Henry, <coughs> where, it was you? What feet? Henry? Oh, sorry. Either way, what's, what do you guys think? Um, I think on the 19th, which Duncan mentioned, um, Ira Helfand will be there, who is, uh, who, Ira Helfand will be there on the 19th, um, on Zoom, who is an expert on this stuff, June 19th, um, so reach out to Vermont Peace Anti-War Coalition, uh, for info on that, um, a couple things. I, Biden has not stopped 
the offensive weapons. He just sent another million dollar shipment. Billion, Billion. yeah. Um, also, uh, I feel like it's important to clarify that the U.S. Um, in some ways may be responding to threats from abroad, but the majority of the what we're seeing is driven by U.S. policy and U.S. actions. Um, and Russia may well be preparing to put nuclear weapons in space. I don't know. But uh, that report, from what I know, comes from the U.S. intelligence agencies. So that is a... Uh, it's something that should be taken with some grain of salt, and in my opinion. And also, Russia and China have proposed to, uh, for a long, long time, I think decades, for universal treaties in space, complete de-weaponization of space in every way. And they've called on the U.S. to join them in that, and the U.S. has not. Um, and the U.S. is also the only country in the world that has a policy since the 70s of it's possible to win a nuclear war as the film talked about um, and that policy is called counter force which means that the intention is to destroy the other side's nuclear weapons um, for the purpose of having a nuclear war without getting hit too hard yourself which implies that a nuclear war is winnable and therefore doable. And no other country in the world has that policy. And it relates to geopolitical tensions that we're seeing now in Ukraine, where if you have a policy that you want to destroy the other party's nuclear weapons, it's essential that you get as close as possible to those nuclear weapons. So we're trying to put nuclear weapons in Ukraine we're trying to put nuclear weapons in Taiwan, as we did in the 50s. And um, I think the American public just needs to know that America is primarily not responding to threats. There are no other nations that have nuclear weapons on our borders. I mean, the question what Jim put forward is why the peace movement, the American peace movement, doesn't exist anymore of what happened on the 60s, 70s, and early 80s that we don't see it on the street. And the answer for that is the American people normalized the idea that their official says what we do or manufacture or act is deterrence. And they're forgetting that the only power used in nuclear power in particular are United States of America and they are responsible for it. Here we saw on the movie or the movie about the movie how the American always make everything about themselves as long as you kill others white america is fine with it they don't react if you kill japanese it's the most normal we don't talk about it if lindsey graham comes and say use a nuclear power in gaza there is no reaction whatsoever as if he didn't say anything it's very much an American. This is American as the apple pie. As long as the American supremacy, American white supremacy, is on the top, it's fine with majority of the American. And you look at the movie and the after movie, what do you see? That the American packaged the idea of fear to make them react to it fear of a nuclear power what was the reaction 
is fear from the movie to be shown outside. What was the reaction? Attendance of four people who are pro-war, from Kissinger to Schultz to uh, even the Holocaust survival, which is he is doesn't recognize the Palestinian existence, by the way, you know, to everybody, to McNamara, they all were mongers, and they became spokespeople of the American and selling the idea, let's package the fear so we will have power, so we will use the power first, you know, not looking at the others because the others have been otherized, you know. I'm not with, let's say, Korea, North Korea having a nuclear power, but they have fear too. From whom? From America. And who support those officials? You. The American who support those officials. You are silent about your official when they make threats like that. You know? And the younger generation are the most magnificent generation on ages, as a matter of fact, when they analyze what's happening around the world. They don't trust the older generation, because they put them on this mass. But actually, the younger generation, they understand and they react, but they are not supported by the majority of the American. So when they go and attack them on the encampment in colleges, we see silence from the older generation, even though they are looking for a change, and they're going to do the change. I know uh, Gary had something to say, but I would like to ask Jim um, to tell us some more about his uh, experiences at the National uh, Deterrence Summit, which is where all these people get together and decide how to really finesse winning nuclear war and how to spend the money. Because that, when I heard you talk about that, that's what really made me aware of the of the difficult situation we're in right now. Thanks. Uh, I, uh, what I didn't mention in this, uh, other than growing up in the cloud, is that uh, uh, the atomic cloud, really, uh, was that uh, in the 1990s, I was working for the Denver Post and doing these big projects, and I realized that the 50th anniversary of Hiroshima was coming up. So, and the bomb really was a Western uh, phenomenon. It was the uranium from mines, uh, the lab in Los Alamos, the test in Trinity down in El Magardo, uh, except for Oak Ridge, which did refine the uranium. Uh, Hanford, of course, where the plutonium was made. Anyway, uh, I did a year and a half study of of the uh, what I called the atomic legacy in the West, which included a lot of waste and all kinds of people dying and all of that, downwinders. I turned many of my projects into books. A couple of years ago, when I started to look in to do that with that series. Um, I discovered quickly that we're now back in the bomb-making business, which surprised me. It, I didn't know about it. I hadn't read about it. I'm a consumer of news, and I didn't know about this. And I discovered that every year, now, now for 17 years, the nuclear industrial complex holds an annual conference of the federal government employees and the contractors. Um, in Washington, D.C. It's called the Nuc Nuclear Deterrence Summit. So I went two years ago. I wrote a piece about that in the Progressive Magazine. The atmosphere is akin to, well, first of all, this is the crowd that wants to build weapons and grow the, um, grow the enterprise. 
uh, I re- distinctly remember uh, one morning when Jean, uh, Jean Ruby, who is the head of the NSSA, uh, in charge of all of this, uh, gave a talk about where we were in terms of rebuilding this enterprise. And the man who interviewed her, who was from Honeywell, when she got done, she, he said to the audience of several hundred people, come on, you folks, don't you realize that we just did this and this and this and this in a year? That calls for a round of applause. And so they applauded. It was like a pep rally, really. And I went this last year, this earlier this year, to the same conference. And we're, we're, we're down the road. The, the people who watch the, watch, the nuclear watchdogs, each of these sites, which are very small groups, often individuals, basically say that there is no control whatsoever. Congress has basically opened their, product, uh, their, their, their pocketbook. To the point that, that you made about uh, the fact that U.S. Uh, is the uh, igniter, if you will, or ignition of the, of the uh, nuclear arms race, I think the case can really be well made. I mean, if, if you go back to the war, I mean, the Soviet Union wanted to match our bomb. But then we began building, building, and building, and building. And we used, as the Kremlin has, when they, when they exploded a bomb, you know, Katie barred the door. We, we then stayed. And we are on top still, by far the nuclear weapons, and we overbuilt it. I mean, we, people died making bombs uh, at Rocky Flats outside of Denver. So, um, because they were exposed in the production. Anyway, where I wanted to go with this, is that's answered your question a little bit, but, but in the second piece that I've written, which will be out in June, and I, I'll, I'll share a little bit about it, because when I heard that Robin was trying to rebuild this piece thing, I thought, geez, I haven't heard anything about this. Why is that? And so I did a, a, an article here about this, and I, because to get the discussion going here about what we should do about it, what you all should do about it, how do we get young people involved? When I showed when I showed my slideshow to my wife, who teaches at UVM, she said these numbers are kind of blo- they, they don't mean anything. What does 1.7 trillion dollars mean? What does it mean in terms of medical hair, care or? free college uh, things. Put it in terms that people, uh, or young kids particularly, will understand. Um, and she said, the next time I show this, you ought to do that. I didn't have time to do that. But let me to give you some bullet points about why, why I've discovered, after a bunch of interviews, why there's such silence. First of all, the Cold War is over. Or it did, it, you know, it, it, it ended in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. and. Even though other things came up with Iraq, Afghanistan, women's rights, Black Lives Matter, economic inequality, women's rights, all these things began to compete for the public interest. And people assumed, I'm quoting from John Tierney, a former congressman who now is head of Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. He said people assumed that this nuclear thing was no longer a problem. It was under control or moving in the right direction. The 1996 Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty ended the test test at uh, actually a- everywhere in the world. Nobody, I guess North Korea has tested, but we have stopped testing, Russia stopped testing. And so it's not in the news anymore that we are, you know, having r- fallout. And so without explosions and radiation releases, uh, the world has become inured to the presence of thousands of warheads. The U.S. news media of which I'm a proud member, has essentially stopped covering the nuclear issue. Since President Obama's, uh, you know, won the Nobel Peace Prize, um, which he got before the signing of this treaty, um, and we have now 1,550 warheads each. And by that, warheads, I mean those are warheads on top of in weapons, right? Forget the ones that are in reserve. Major foundations have stopped funding this peace issue. The MacArthur Foundation, uh, which had given $100 million, announced in last year that it would ex- exit the nuclear field. Uh, it has a lot to do with the, the difference between deterrence and disarmament, which I won't get into. But 
also, you know, most of the grants for peace movements have been really small, and they've gone to they've gone to legitimate foundations, which are tied in really with the power structure. People from Congress come and go into these big MacArthur Foundation types, not the little man on the street. They don't get the the the, 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 the protesters uh, in Vermont, for example, didn't get grant money that I know of, uh, and they certainly don't today. Um, Lastly, or uh, the other thing is that the Defense Department overwhelms peace groups with its lobbying power. Uh, in 2023, contractors, defense contractors, spent $70 million lobbying Congress to promote the, 19, the 2024 National Defense Authorization Act, which budgeted $850 billion and $24 billion to the National Security, uh, Nuclear Security Administration. Well. That's Open Secrets is the website that will tell you who's spending what. General Dynamics, for example, the company that produces submarines, um, you know, is uh, they spent $64 million. Uh, they've also, as someone alluded earlier, to putting pieces of this enterprise almost in every, in every state. Every state has pieces of this, of this uh, enterprise, and congressmen then, Lindsey Graham is, you know, uh, chief among them, uh, supporting jobs uh, and growth of that enterprise. Young people, this is, comes from the Middlebury uh, uh, think tank in, in California. Young people have a lot of issues competing for their attention. And one of them said to me, if I was 20 years old today I didn't, I, and getting my fit, feet wet, I don't know if that I would choose to work on nuclear weapons. And the other thing is that, going back to our movie here, nuclear Armageddon is not, like, is not as visible as in popular, popular culture as it was in the days of Dr. Strangelove on the beach the day after. So we haven't had have. Oppenheimer, as I already mentioned, I think is a great movie, but it really doesn't make you want to you know, come out of the theater and stop nuclear war. So um, the good news is, that there is beginning to be a few young people involved and organizations that are trying to build this back up. Robin will do the work here in town. Uh, there's a company called Back, uh, a nonprofit called Back from the Brink, which has now 18 hubs of activities, uh, and their five point policy basically is to take, you know, the weapons off. I won't go into it, hair trigger alert, all of that. But they have the two, I talked to to two young people who belong to that organization, and their ultimate goal is to persuade Congress and the President to sign the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Peter Welch, when he was a congressman, supported doing that. But Congress is only, only 44 members of Congress have become co-signers of, uh, of that treaty. Um, so there was a young man in, New Hampshire. Uh, he's 16 years old, and he read about what Vermont did and decided he would start his own young people's nuclear pro uh, nonprofit. And he, uh, he, 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 he learned this after, let me find the word here, because it's something, really, it's something you just reported. His name is Rishi Gurudevan, 16-year-old junior, and he said, and he, he did this after a talk at his school, Exeter Academy, by Dr. Ira Helfand, who came to that school, and that's when he decided to start Students for Nuclear Disarmament. Um, back from the brink, I was also hired a woman, a young woman in, uh, in California, and she's now become a full-time activist. She's 23 years old, and I talk about her in my piece. And she talks about this issue of money being spent on nuclear bombs when there are so many other needs. So there are beginning movements, but it's going to take a long time, I think, to build it back up again to where we have, where we can convince Congress or people to march in the streets or however we do it, but anyway, that's who else would like to have a comment? Yes.
left. Can everyone hear me? My family, the Colbys, first came to this country in 1635. They fought in every single war. Some of the Colbys, as you know, were involved in the, in the CIA. Some of them have been generals. Some of them have been officers. <clears throat> We've always had a dedication to this country. I want to make that clear. We are failing. It was liberals that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. People forget that. It was liberals that founded capitalism under Adam Smith. It was liberalism that has built the American empire. Not the fascists who are jet are coming over the hill to try to take over. Do we have no choice but to support the liberals right now? But at the same time, we should grow beyond them, which means taking seriously who runs this country. We don't run it. The American people don't run this country. And frankly, since George Washington crushed the rebellion of the, of the Whiskey Rebellion in Pennsylvania, we have never owned it. It's always been controlled by people of wealth. There have been many attempts to try to moderate that, but no one wants to talk about that fact. And you will never be able to change American farm policy or domestic policy until you face the fact that there is a ruling class in America that has to be replaced. I'd like to see it done democratically. I'd like to see it done peacefully. But it has to be done because the fate of the world depends on it. I've known this since I've been a kid. When I started to study the DuPonts, when I, who made the atomic bomb, the first one, when I started to study the ruling class, there have been efforts to suppress books like mine, and it's been done by the DuPonts, but it's also been done by the federal courts. You're not going to have any luck with the federal courts. You're not going to have any luck with a bought and sold Congress until it's replaced by people that represent the population. That means building an entirely different system, an entirely different political party than what you have now. Maybe if the Democratic Party can be converted. Yeah, I've been trying for decades. The fact is, they are not willing to change. And because of the class nature of the Democratic Party, the, frankly, the professionals, oh, she's coming over, the professionals and the owners, they will never, never surrender. I just came from my father, my brother's funeral, and I traveled along the west, the, excuse me, the uh, Penn, lower California court, uh, Florida. Uh, Florida, the coast. I will tell you right now that we're losing. We've already lost. We haven't even assumed that we regained it. And there was nothing along that coastline but mansions the american people paid for those mansions but no one wants to talk about it especially liberals because they're afraid their money will dry up in their campaigns their political campaigns and they depend on them for all sorts of things like loans gratuities of your foundations, all sorts of ma materials that th we get and we watch our TV and they want to shut me up right now. So I will surrender this. Not they. She's not a DuPont. <laughs> <laughs> She's 
He doesn't have to be. Yeah. You're not at the bar yeah. either. Okay, thank you. Thank you for all the participants, and I just want to give Jim Geyer a, a, a few words. That when, when you said that people are afraid, and Wafik said the same thing, and when we were working on this years ago, uh, working on the nuclear uh, town meeting, uh, weapons, uh, you know, nuclear freeze at town meeting, we had a group, and we had we talked about facts and fears, and we thought that the fears were going to be about the nuclear weapons, and it wasn't. It was all about talking to your neighbor, your family, the people closest to you. They were the ones that everybody was afraid of. That's about it. That's that's our problem, I think. And now what? Now what we I don't know how you get over that. Um, movements help, but that's it's something to think about. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't have the answer. Well, but this was a really great, really great. Good to see you. One more, one more person to speak. Oops. Um, is this on? Oh, okay. Um, well, for an optimistic uh, viewpoint, it is heartening to see all the young people on the campuses because they have empathy, and that's what matters most to me. And um, so hopefully they're learning some history. I think our whole lot of the public doesn't know enough history of what's behind all this. Um, and then uh, Jim just mentioned fear of talking with people and with your family. Well, I think we have to start talking, uh, even if it's uncomfortable, with other people. Um, so. I also wanted, to, I wondered what happened between the march in on New York and the town meeting resolutions, and there was a lot of awareness, and then it got ignored. My suspicion is it's, uh, there was an effort to keep the, the business of weapons going, which has happened, but, um, I was reading an article recently, too, about think tanks have also um, promoted this. Think tanks that act like they're neutral <laughs> when they're not. Uh, but anyway, I think maybe we have to educate each other. Uh, well, well, there's still some of us <laughs> so that the young people will uh, be encouraged. They're encouraging us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, well, let's let's keep talking. Let's keep reaching out, and uh, I'd just like to have uh, Duncan Duncan Nichols uh, say the event is going to be coming up in June, and uh, when is that? And yeah. who is um, Dr. Helford? Oh, Dr. Helfand. Well, Nancy. Okay, so a, a month from today, uh, on the nineteenth, there'll be a Zoom meeting. And so no one has to drive. And we're going to be following up on this, today's event, and talk, and conversation, and ideas. Um, and Ira Helfand will speak. And he is with Back from the Brink in, New in Massachusetts, a longtime uh, advocate. And I guess that's, that's it. We'll, those who have signed up on our uh, clipboard will send you an email with that link. And uh, thank you. Uh, you speakers were I wonderful. Just wanna, I just want a closing thought uh, about all the wonderful um, demonstrations that have gone, been going on in all the campuses, which is really encouraging. And in all my uh, seven decades of uh, sort of living with this uh, Middle East conflict, this is just unheard of. I mean, it's incredible. And there's been efforts to, to make it look like it's violent. Now we found out it's from outside agitators, that most of the demonstrations have been pe peaceful. So, so this is a note of hope for us. And, and what I'm hoping is that we can broaden the movement. For instance, all those that are demonstrating uh, against what's going on in Gaza connect with the climate activists. 
And, and if they understand that one of the primary motivators of all these conflicts have been the oil companies that are making profits and the, and the uh, military, which is making huge profits, uh, that, that once that is better understood, you will have a broader movement. So I'm hopeful. Maybe we can end on a note of hope.